Hello, Kai. How are you? Shout out to you. I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Yeah. Well, we're working really hard to get you specimens. Yes. Begin analyzing. It's okay. I still have to get a key to get into the lab anyways. Yeah. It all tends to happen in herks and jerks. Yeah, that's fun. I like I just got my stole from chemistry department today. You're what from the chemistry department? My stole. The the chemistry department uh stole for graduation. Oh. Yeah. Is that like a hat or something or no, the, the banner, the stole thingy. The banner? Not banner, the, the one that you wear, like, you know, around your neck. Oh, right, the um, the hood. Oh, no, not not the hood, the, it's called a stole, right? Am I, am I saying oh, that? I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I was only ever went through this once. Wait, what? No, you probably went through this a couple of times. You have a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember though. It's um yeah the the stole thingy the one you drape around your neck and then leans down. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Right, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, it's like a couple months late, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that thingy there would just. Show. Yeah. Thingy. Uh, oh, awesome! I like it. Yeah. Oh, that is nice just came in like two months after I graduated. Oh geez, that's nice. I didn't get one. Did you, you didn't get one, Calvin? No. I'm jealous. Oh my gosh. You did get one the heck you graduated too. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> Probably bought it at Walmart. I wish I would have gotten it sooner. <laughs> oh gosh. Mm. So, uh, do either of you gentlemen have questions about the um, the midterm, the take home midterm? Because that's that's all I'm going to do today. Is I'm just going to take questions. Oh, As of now, um, well, I'm still reading the paper. So, I, I have a question for the I have a question for the first paper. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me put you guys down here. So did I, sh there we go. Hello, Richard, how are you? Doing well, how about yourself? I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm. Uh, Life forced me into the lab today, and I'm enjoying myself. Nice. It's good to be in the lab. Yeah, yeah it is a good thing. It is a good thing. And I'm trying to encourage folks to ask questions about the midterm, because that's all I'm going to do today. I'm just going to answer questions. And um, I don't know exactly how I'm going to get around a question like describe Raman scattering, include a discussion of Rayleigh scattering, how this is removed from the Raman spectrum, and how Raman scattering produces a vibrational spectrum of the molecule. But I can talk about Raman. <laughs> no. Uh, one thing I, I did not talk about how the um, how the Rayleigh scattering is removed. I didn't mention that. But uh, but I could. Mm -hmm. Hello, Lily. Hello, Kenya. Hello, Adam. 
Hello. Kenya, did you know that you got your beautiful face onto my website? Yeah, I was going to um, <clears throat> bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever uh, crop the videos? <laughs> no, no, I don't. What? That would be such a shame. You're so cute. <laughs> my gosh. My gosh. I like it. I don't know if you don't like it, but I like it. What? I like your picture. Oh. <laughs> it's a very yeah. different thumbnail to have than your normal ones. Yeah, it's <laughs> like on canvas, you know? <laughs> it's on oh, YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't choose the thumbnails. I just sort of like upload, do whatever you're going to do, you know? And the first 10 minutes is me bumbling around and swearing and cursing and you know, at least I'm not going to do a Jeffrey Tubin. Yeah, this is why I keep my camera off now. Yes, yes. But, um, oh, and you know, last, uh, last Tuesdays did not record. I do not know how to recover it. What happened was 55 from the morning. I, I recorded that lecture and it sends this dialogue says, okay, it's here. Do you want me to convert it? You know, and that was all in the background. And um, uh, and I didn't notice it and it didn't, it couldn't, it couldn't record the new one. Wow. So, yeah. well, so far we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six of eight male participants and zero of five female participants willing to share their beautiful visage, even though Richard's not even here. I can see something on his wall, which is attractive. Can you guys see the picture of everybody? There he is, there he is. <laughs> uh, I love it. Okay, so my plan for today is to answer questions for you for the midterm, to make your life easier, right? So if you're finished the midterm, if you're finished with the midterm, you should get a drink because I'm going to be giving away a lot of answers today. But, Can you make sure that this is actually recorded, Dr. Terrell? I, I, as far as I know, it's being recorded. I, as far as I know, as far as I know. But, um, uh, but I, I'm not going to answer these super directly. I'll be a little bit um, coy. Lily, you're here. Yay. <laughs> Hi. I figured Hi. since this, since I could use my computer to type things in, I could turn my video on my iPad. Thank you. That's wonderful. And Carla's here. Yay, Carla. So, um, so if we get to 605 and no one has asked a question, I'm going to end the class. Kenya, you have a mask. Can you explain Riley scattering, please? Oh, Riley scattering? Sure. Yes, yeah, you said Rayleigh... that you didn't talk about that and how it's removed. Yeah, so Riley scattering is uh, elastic light scattering off of molecules. And it's, um, it's uh, so there's strange things that happen between interaction between light and matter, right? You can think of like glass or other transparent dielectrics, right? And they, they conduct um, light, you know, and it'll, it'll maintain its, like if you have a laser beam, it's not going to scatter away, right? But um, so it's not going to scatter like it would scatter off large things, right? 
And most of the interactions that that laser beam have with molecules is through this induced dipole moment, right? Where the electric field from the light polarizes the molecule, and then that wave sums with the um, electric field of the light. And it's actually that summing process that slows the light down, right? But there's also a small fraction of those, um, uh, a small fraction of that radiation or the induced dipole moments that actually radiate in completely different directions. They change the, the direction vector of the light, right? And so even though, um, so if I were to shine a laser beam across my, in front of my face right now, would you be able to see it? Aditya, why not? Uh, because there's nothing in the air. I mean, unless it's super dusty where you are, uh, there's nothing in the air to, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, I can sort of hear you. I, you can hear me trying to increase my volume, but yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. I think there's a problem with my headphones. Um, there's nothing in the air unless it's like super dusty or something for the uh, laser to, I guess, display on. So you wouldn't be able to see it. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good, you managed to get through that entire answer without using the word that I'm looking for. <laughs> So you you the the laser beam goes past my face and it doesn't hit any dust particles. And what happens when it hits the dust particles? The beam does what? It displays, but what's the technical term we're looking for here? Scatter? It doesn't scatter, exactly, right? <clears throat> so that would be called Tyndall or or possibly even me scattering. There's different regimes, right? But Rayleigh scattering is for molecules, extremely small entities that don't normally interact with light, except in the refraction sense, right? And so Rayleigh scattering is elastic, and it's that's uh, has predictable directionality. It also has a predictable wavelength dependence. And um, so, um, when you say elastic, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. When I say elastic, you so it's scattering, right? And then it comes back. The energy comes back. Right, right. So, so when the light, when the when the photon diverts, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it so. In Rayleigh scattering, as far as I know, it's completely elastic. That is, um, let's say that it is a single photon that interacts with a molecule without absorption and changes its direction. And if that's elastic, then the new direction, the new or the photon has the same frequency as it had before it interacted. Ah, so there's no, there's no like net loss. Exactly, exactly. So this is key to Rayleigh scattering. Rayleigh is elastic. Okay, thanks. So um, now, have you guys ever heard of um, optical tweezers? Oh my God, it's such a big world out there, you guys. It's so cool. So if you take a laser and you focus it through a, um, a, a, a microscope objective and you get it down to a really intense point, then you can literally place small, small um, like a, um, latex beads or small like cells and things like that. You can place them in that focal point and you can literally move them around by moving the focal point of the lens, right? So, 
So that that's basically mediated by light scattering. And that mechanism cannot be completely elastic, right? Because those photons, they have to divert a, an object. They have to put force on something. So the photons that scatter off have to be lower energy, right? But, um, and I don't know whether Rayleigh scattering has these very tiny inelastic components. But Rayleigh scattering is, for our purposes, for talking about Raman, you know, and on the nano, like within plus or minus 0.05 nanometers or so in the mid visible, it's elastic. You know? So a laser, a laser beam might have a bandwidth of 0.05 nanometers, or maybe 0.1 or 0.2 nanometers. Do you guys understand what I mean by that? Is it how wide the laser beam is or? Mm -hmm. But how spectrally broad it is. Like it's, it could be, it could be a point or it could be a super narrow beam, right? Physically, like in terms of dimensions, but the, the purity of the wavelength or the purity of the frequency is, is given by, let's say it's 632.85 plus minus 0.02. You know, that's, that's, that's a gas laser, you know, that's a helium neon laser wavelength. And if you get that, that narrow of a wavelength distribution, then what you have to, then if you do Raman spectrum with that, what you need to remove is you need to remove 632.85 plus 0.2 and minus 0.2, right? Probably plus, or I'm sorry, plus 0.02, minus 0.02, right? You probably have to go out maybe three of those, plus 0.06 and minus 0.06. So if it's a Gaussian distribution in frequency space or wavelength space, then you're gonna get the main peak plus about three sigma on either side. And that will remove 99.9% .9 of the light of the Rayleigh scattering. Does that make sense? So um, Rayleigh is elastic. So does Rayleigh scattering have any information about the molecules? Any spectroscopic information about the molecules? Richard says no. What do you mean by no? It probably means no, huh? Yeah, no. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no means no. Understand that, Roger. No means no. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so there's no spectral information in the in the Rayleigh P. Right? I mean, there's probably ways you can get it, I don't know. But, uh, but the Raman peaks have vibrational information in them, right? So because it's elastic and doesn't have information, it needs to be removed. And there's two ways it's removed. One is called a holographic notch filter. And they're about a thousand dollars, but they are amazing. And they could just, you can buy a holographic notch filter for a given laser line, and it will just chop out that laser line and nothing else. And it's a stack of, it's a dielectric stack. It's a stack of alternating dielectric materials of various thickness, and it just kills that one wavelength. And so you can get holographic notch filters uh, with um, 
plus minus one nanometer. So you can take out the laser light with this type of filter and uh, you can also remove it with the monochromator. So, um, okay, I'm, I think, I think that's all I, that's all I'm really looking for in that type of an answer. How are you doing, Hikun? Uh, I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm so confused about the holographic notch filter. Ah, okay. Great. So um, uh, filters are, you, they, they look like little circles of glass, right? So you can buy them from fish, uh, from Edmund Optics, right? And they'll sell you this thousand dollar little circle of glass, right? Might be one centimeter in diameter, right? And you can look through it and you say, gee, it looks just like a piece of glass, right? but it has stacks of magnesium fluoride and silicon dioxide in such a way that the light bounces around in there and it cancels out all of the laser wavelength. So if you put one, uh, if you like had one for a laser beam and you're shoot, shooting that laser beam on the desk, right? You could look through that holographic notch filter and you would not see the laser beam at all. It would just vanish because all the light that goes into that holographic notch filter at the laser frequency just goes away. Oh, then um, what does the po positive negative one nanometer actually mean? Ah, oh, so, so what that means is um, it, it, it might, you might be able to get it for like, um, um, 632.8 plus or minus one nanometer. So that means it'll go from 631.8 to 633.8. Those are the wavelengths that will be removed. Oh, okay. So that's in the red. Those are all red wavelengths. And so if you're using a helium neon laser and you had this filter, then you just would not see see anything oh okay thank you yeah okay so how does the monochromator remove the rest of the um relay peak sorry what was the question how does the monochromator remove the rest of the Rayleigh peak. Can it be that it removes um, any extra wavelengths <clears throat> that we're not looking at for the Raman? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. But um, you know when when you put light into the monochromator, what happens is that um, it it it's dispersed spatially, right? So the light hits a target, and it goes from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, as a function of distance along the it's called a focal plane, right? And so if you, if you had um, uh, Rayleigh scattering along with Raman on either side, and it were dispersed across a plane like that, then you could use that spectrum, that spectrum of light, that, that spaced out light 
and you could remove certain wavelengths simply by um, uh, absorbing that light in that place, maybe putting a piece of black absorber there, or you could just turn off those pixels or on your detector. Or, could you also kick them off in a different direction with a monochromator? Uh, you know, uh, that's really interesting because nowadays um, people use micro mirror arrays. And do you guys know what those are? They are so friggin' cool. But um, uh, it, for, for, for certain types of displays for projectors, right? What they do is they have um, uh, they they have a, a mirror surface, but every every point on the surface is on a little electrically actuatable cantilever, and you can tilt them down or up, right? And so um, what what you can do in spectroscopy then is you can you can disperse your spectrum across a micro mirror array and you can remove certain wavelengths just by tilting the, uh, the mirror down. And that will just spoil the reflectivity or it'll send the beam off somewhere else, off to a, a beam dump. But um, that's a really interesting, it's, such an interesting technology and there's um there's a new um type of uh spectrometer on it basically on a chip and um ti is is marketing it now micro mirror array spectroscopy let's try that Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. So here's here's an example, right? You've got a telescope, and the light is focused onto this micro mirror array. And then some of the light is rejected, and some of it's passed into a spectrometer. You know, and um, it's it's basically a way to control the reflectivity of a surface. Anyway, um, I digress here a little bit. So you can, but the, the idea is that by using a monochromator, right, you can just, you can just set the monochromator to display only, for example, 633.8 and greater wavelengths, right? You can tilt the grading with a, with a, with a, um, with a setting, right? A setting will tilt the grading and you can have it just place the 632.8 off the detector. And so you can only you only can observe the red shifted light. Okay. More questions. I had a quick general question. Yeah. You're not worried about uh, specific wavelengths and or sorry, not specific uh, volumes and concentrations, are you? Or no, no I'm, I'm not going to ask. No, 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 I mean, like not, not, not in this. The questions are all there. there. I don't think there's any. Oh, there's a robot again. Your your mic is like very weird. Went, you know, to the evil side. Like an underwater fan. Yeah. yeah. Became like an android again. Oh my god. Okay, how am I now? 
The same. The same. The same. That was the creepiest think of a questions I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, a little alarming. No. Is, is it better now? Is, is it better now? Would restarting the Zoom call help, or is that too much work? Can you explain the Kerr effect?
that the backscattering interferometry? Uh, is it the refractive index? Yeah, I had a question about the curve Doesn't the R R I measure kind of like the light and how it's bent or something like that when it goes through? So if there's
Yes. The chat has some votes, Dr. Carroll. There's a background, so yeah, yeah, Kenya saved me there because physics. When it measures the background, so you're always comparing to your background solvent or whatever mobile phase you're using, and the presence of your analyte can increase or decrease it. You're just measuring a change, and I don't think it's always increasing. Um, it's less. Down. Hey, Richard, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, could you explain that again? Sorry, I think you're on mute. Yeah, in a refractive index detector, you're measuring, you have two, well, the one I've used, you have two cells and one cell measures the mobile phase you're using or solvent. And when a, when an analyte passes through, you're measuring the difference and the refractive index of that analyte could be um, to make it go either way, positive or negative. So you can get a negative peak in when that uh, analyte passes the detector. 
Got it. Thank you so much. So I'm kind of confused about how we know what has a greater RI. Are these just values that we have to look up or is there a way of knowing? Do I still sound like Max Headroom? No. Oh, great. Excellent. I just turned it off and back on again. Thank you, Adam. Adam coached me through this. Ah, okay. So let's see. Yeah, the silent silent uh, lecture was being weird is is eerie. Pretty weird. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I'm not completely useless then. Okay, so um, why would large polarizability give a large Raman cross-section? Because the Raman signal is proportional to D alpha DX Raman is proportional to D alpha by DX or by DR maybe. Where R is the, um, the it's the vibrational coordinate. So if it's a diatomic, it's just a bond link. Right? And so uh, D alpha by, by DR K 
can be larger if, if alpha is larger. And if alpha is large, the refractive index is large. Sort of, they just sort of connect those concepts. I don't mean to get too weird on you guys, but does that help at all? Or because polarizability leads to a refractive index. All right, so um, more questions, please. Good, Pauline's gonna ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Terrell, can you explain um, electrophoretic mobility? Sure, absolutely. So electrophoretic mobility is really, it's just um, a dV by dE. So uh, it's the change in velocity with, with electric field. So if you, if you go have an electric field of one volt per centimeter, you'll get, you know, one millimeter per second of of um, of electro uh, velocity, right? So dV by dE is electrophoretic mobility. Does that make sense? So um, there's another important part of electrophoretic mobility. However, is um, the uh, the size and charge dependence, right? So, um, uh, electrophoretic mobility is a, a function of charge. It's a positive function of charge, and a negative function of. It's basically the radius, the uh, hydrodynamic radius of the the pseudospherical molecule, right? So, um, uh, let's say that calcium and sulfate have the same radius. Let's just say they have the same hydrodynamic radius just for for argument's sake right now. Would they have the same electrophoretic mobility? Can you repeat the question? What, what was the same between the two again? Uh, electrophoretic mobility. No, well, uh, calcium and uh, so, or sulfur have the same what? Would calcium? plus two and sulfate minus two have the same electrophoretic mobility, assuming they had the same radius. Mm. So all I've told you is that uh, you, uh, the electrophoretic mobility is a proportional to Um, charge and inversely proportional to uh, radius. And I'm saying if they have the same radius, would they have the same electrophoretic mobility? 
and it's it's basically a yes or no answer, right? No. So you've got a twenty percent chance. <laughs> they would not have the same mobility. Okay, why not? Well, they have opposite charge, so they're going to interact differently. Okay, how how will they interact? So the assuming it's a silica sidewall mm -hmm. and that is negative therefore yeah. it'll be positive attracted on the side so calcium would be attracted to the sidewall therefore slowing the <laughs> sorry my wife is singing <laughs> oh that's so cute she has know. headphones on so she can't hear me <laughs> I would get you. I I I want to get you in trouble right now. But I'll, <laughs> I'll resist the urge. Um, okay. So the calcium is. Uh... So so let me let me. Can I coach you just a little bit here? Because you're yeah, going yeah. down a rabbit hole that I sometimes go down. Let's say the electro. Let's say that the um, the uh, the cations go towards the negative pole, right? Uh huh. That's just the way it works. You know, whatever the EOF is or whatever. Okay. So if the cations go to the right. Then the anions go to the oh, left. Right. They go opposite directions. Why is that, why is that puzzling to you? I thought so, they all still flowed in one direction, though, oh, as, a, oh, as yeah. a net so, flow. Oh, yeah, yeah. The EOF, that's called electroosmotic flow. There's two, okay. there's, there's two components. Electroosmotic. So ignoring that part. Right. And electrophoretic yes. mobility, though, is independent of it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Got it. So it would be equal and opposite. Okay, cool. That was a good question. I forgot what it was, but it spurred a little conversation here. Don't be shy, guys. Just... Hey, Calvin. Yeah, Calvin came and went. So you're all going to get A pluses? If you give it to us. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> That's true. It is in my hands. But um, uh, Calvin says he can't hear anything. That's why he's not replying. Oh, oh no. I don't think it's my fault, though. Because if other people can hear me, then. Oh, no, it's his laptop's fault. Mm. Tell him to go to the sound control panel and turn it off and on again. Would it be possible to go over the concept of plate counts? Of, of what counts? Plate counts. Oh, plate counts. Yes, plate counts. So, um, that's a good question. So um, let's talk about play counts here. Play counts. It, play counts is given the symbol n, right? And uh, a larger n means a narrower peak in a, in any kind of chromatographic or electrophoretic situation. Oops. What did I capitalize chromatography there? Okay, so, um, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, the plate height 
is H. And um, it just has the opposite thing, uh, a smaller H. Um, like, um, let's see. H is the height per plate. So it's the length divided by H is N. So um, oops, L divided by H equals N, where L is the uh, length of the column. Right? So, um, So um, in, in, in chromatography, H um, is equal to um, A plus B over U plus C times U, where U is the, the mobile phase velocity. Um, A is the tortuosity. B is the um, <clears throat> longitudinal diffusion. And C is the resistance, the mass transfer. C is a kinetic term. Okay, so in um, in uh, electrophoresis, there's a simpler expression, and it's only dependent on E. And the larger E, the smaller H. Or in other words, a larger E is better. I've now I'm in the habit of typing everything. <laughs> is that a help? It later, that's fine. Yeah, we can look at it later. Yeah, I'll publish this thing. So, um, so this means that in uh, capillary electrophoresis, having a larger field is advantageous. So, why not just turn up the voltage? Just turn it up. Is it the uh, the heat? It is the heat. Heat is your enemy there, right? So as you begin, as you exceed the ability of the capillary to discharge the heat generated by the motion of the charges through the capillary, then that that it's called joule heating, that that amount of heat that you dissipated in the capillary will begin to increase the temperature of the capillary. And then that changes everything, basically. And that will cause the bands to become broader. So E, as you increase E, the bands will get narrower, but then they'll start to get broader again, <laughs> right? So what can you do to increase that limit to which you can push the field. Can you, you can get like a thousand volts per centimeter. But if you go above that, then the peaks get broad. What, what can you change about the column to be able to get 2000 volts per centimeter? You just put everything on ice? No. 
Doesn't help. Because that means that, that the, sorry? Oh, I was just gonna say, is that why they were using the shorter capillaries or? Well, that it, it's basically in the title of the paper. High speed capillary. High speed capillary electrophoresis, yeah. Oh, the thin wall. The thin walls, right. So how big is how big is 20 microns? And you can use, yeah, I think Dan put his fingers together. Small. Yeah, it's, it's like very small. A strand of hair or something. <laughs> yes, exactly. So if you pull out a piece of your hair, that's about 100 microns in diameter. And so 20 microns is one fifth of that, right? And that's the width of the capillary. That's the, that's the, I'm sorry, that's the thickness of the capillary wall, right? So between the interior and the exterior, there's 20 microns of glass. And this is, has never been done, right? Because in the past, everyone has always, oops, the comments are getting interesting here, aren't they? Got to check out the comments. Ah, yeah, 0. 0.0007 inches, right, yeah. Oh, someone who reads the dimension. <laughs> so it creates a good mood. <laughs> That's a good idea. Actually, I um, uh, I finished the gin last night. My son, he bought this Hendrix gin. It is so good. Oh, my God. I'm going to become an alcoholic now. It's inevitable because these things are so good. Anyway. <clears throat> Yeah, it's 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 crazy, but um, but yeah, I'll 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 buy some Hendrix on the way home, and I'll make sure I'm in a good mood when I grade your papers. But it's actually a real challenge, right? Because there's two things, right? One, I have to not know whose work I'm grading, right? Because I'm biased, you know, I'm biased. So I have to I have to randomize the name. I have to I have to erase the names. I have to randomize the order. And I have to grade question by question, right? So I have to grade all all question one, right? In a random order. Then all question two in a random order. And all question three in a random order. It's not so easy to do. But otherwise you're biased. You know, you're you're picking favorites, man. So anyway. <sighs> so seven, it's a close 25 microns, 25.4 microns actually, is one one thousandth of an inch. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. You might just accept your bias, but you know, you don't want to do that, really. Oh yeah, I could make everyone my favorite, but you know, I, I'm probably everybody's going to get a B or a better in this class. You know, I, I'm I'm pretty easy grader, but if you guys just fall on your faces, I'm going to give you a C, right? So you have to try, you have to try. And if you're having a hard time, like, oh my God, I don't understand a word this jerk says, then you have to let me know. You have to like, give me some kind of heads up. Like, like hey, Dr. T, I'm terrified because every time you talk, it sounds like wow, 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 I don't understand anything. Hey, Dr. T. Um, yeah? I don't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Noted. Noted. <laughs> noted. Okay. All right. So, um, so I have a I have a physical orientation. I have a physical um, sort of a, a perspective on things, right? 
and I like to go back to the basic physics of what's happening, right? Like, so polarizability, refractive index. So that, that, that was, that came up for me when we were talking a little bit, a little bit ago, right? It's like, why does refractive index depend on polarizability? Well, it's because the electric field of the light polarizes the material, right? It, it distorts the electron cloud. That's polarization, right? And so that's the way I tend to think about this, right? Does that help? Hopefully, hopefully a little bit. You can put a bug in my head. You find there's very little in there. Just a couple of thoughts running around, clanging off the walls. Ding, 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 ding. If I turn my head, you can see through my ears. There's a wind blowing it, it whistles. <laughs> so, um, okay, most disappointing aspect of the project. Well, for me, that's actually a fairly straightforward answer, is that in, in, the, um, in the paper where they did the uh, concentration with the acoustic field, um, Aside from that, it was all completely conventional SIRS, right? They did, they, they DNA tagged these rods and then they detected rhodamine 6G. I, I was under the impression that they were detecting the nuclides, the, the guanine, adenine, thymine, and cytidine, right? But they weren't. They were just detecting rhodamine 6G. And I've seen, I've seen a detection of nucleic acids by Raman before. And I thought, oh, this is really cool. You know, they, you know, they're enhancing it with the rods, et cetera. But the only thing novel about that entire experiment was the fact that they were able to, to, to take this channel and they were able to focus everything into a really small spot with the acoustics. Wait, Dr. Terrell, on the paper, it says that um, the UAIE base SIR sensing for ultra trace nucleic acid detection was also investigated. So isn't that like part of that or am I like missing something? Um, uh, I have to get the paper, I have to dig up the paper what is the UAI? What is that? <laughs> That's what they used. <laughs> okay. It's um. Uh, let me open up the. Here. Uh, the, is that the UAIE. Is in... Yeah, it's, it's the like... ultrasonic oh, oh, aggregation induced oh, yeah, yeah. enrichment based. Yeah, yeah. That that's UAIE is just basically that everything crashed into a small little piece when they agitated it, you know, when they shook it up on this, uh, uh, on this piezo thing. That's UAIE, just bzzz, everything goes to the middle, you know? Okay, so were they also trying to, um, wait, oh yeah, were they also trying to identify the mRNA that they talked at the very beginning or something? You know, yeah, so that's another thing to get hung up on here, right? Is it's just all about DNA specificity. You know, plus you have to tag the DNA in solution that you're detecting. Like what? How is that helpful? <laughs> you know, it's way better to do PCR, you know? You can just you can you can set up the primers for PCR such that you can detect a particular piece of it and just 
multiply the bejesus out of it, right? And then detect it using any any standard method. This ultra trace is, you know, it only applies to labeled, that is, tagged DNA, DNA that has rhodamine stuck to it. So um, here, let me find the, it's like way in the last uh, figure, right? There it is right there. They, they buy the capture probe, they buy the target probe, they, they maybe even buy the labeled target probe, right? But it's not a probe, sorry, just the target, the capture probe and the target. <laughs> ah! So the capture probe, the, the probe and the target are opposite things, right? And so all you're seeing when you do this experiment is they duplex, and then you see the rhodamine in the spectrum, that's all. And it's interesting because if you didn't have the nano rod there, uh, you could see it by fluorescence, right? But you'd have to, you'd have to, you'd have to have your capture probe sort of tied down somehow. You know, but you can, you can literally see individual rhodamine 6G molecules with a fluorescence microscope. Single molecules. You know how little stuff that is? That's like 10 to the minus 20th grams. How crazy is that? You know, that's um, uh, uh, a millionth of a millionth of a millionth grams, you know? <laughs> 6, 12, 18, you're not even there yet. <laughs> you got a hundred fold to go still. So it's not really that impressive as these things go. You know? If you have if you have a freaking rhodamine attached to the molecule you're looking for, why would you do SIRS? You know, you can see the single molecules with a fluorescence microscope. So that's why it was a little bit disappointing for me, you know. Because I was real excited about it, but then I didn't really understand it until later, like, oh. Okay, guys. It is officially the gin and tonic hour, but I'm at work today. Wait, I have to, yes, yes, Ivy. Um, kind of a personal aside, but I sent you an email like two weeks ago and you never responded to it. Oh, Jesus, I'm so sorry. Oh, gosh. Um, I'll it's okay. find life, it. Life, life gets in the way. I just wanted to know, let you know that I sent you an email two weeks ago. and you Okay. Responded. Okay. I will find it. I'm so sorry. I think, you know, I'm a little bit ADD and I'm also like, I get a lot of crap by email and sometimes things just. <sighs> Especially during this pandemic where we're all just online. <sighs> if we were in person, I, I would have come to like your office or something right but, right 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 i am so sorry but i will i will find your email and i will respond hey, thank right. you. okay of course oh yeah 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 okay absolutely yeah we can do that anytime like for example um uh maybe tomorrow we'll set up a zoom okay cool thank you excellent great good i'll talk to everybody soon okay thank you all righty, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, hopefully it was out helpful. Okay. Don't 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 forget your insults in in the paper. Have fun with your gin and tonic. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh jeez.